All right, let's get our, get our Bibles open. We've got 211 verses to cover in the next two weeks. And sometimes I only cover one verse a week, so it's going to, take, going to be a, a quick trip for me, but I think it is something you will really, really enjoy. We have trouble understanding the book of Revelation because it is so different, we would say, from every other book in the Bible. That is not right. We are looking tonight at a study, the first of two week studies of the book of Zechariah. There is so much in the book of Zechariah that is like the language that's in the book of Revelation. And if we can get the Jewish mind to understand what's in Zechariah, and it's pretty easy in Zechariah, it'll help us when we come to the book of Revelation. And we need to, need to, be, need to be aware of that. Let's get, to, let's get to the text. Zechariah chapter 1. Uh, how does he begin? Well, he identifies when he is speaking. You recognize this date in the second year of Darius in the eighth month. Now, where does that fit? When we studied Haggai last week, you remember it was in the sixth month, the uh, early part of the sixth month. And then all of a sudden we got over to the ninth month in the book of Haggai. And so we got a, the book of Haggai covers three months from the sixth month to the ninth month. And this starts in the eighth month. And so right in, right in the middle of it all, these two prophets are trying to get everything to being happen. Haggai is where he says, you have not yet built my house, you've built your house, but you have not yet built my house, and that is not right. So what does he say? Well, in, those, in that first paragraph, he says, look, do not be like your fathers. That's, that's, in, that's in verse 2, he says, in verse, uh, verse 3 he says, Do not be like your fathers. And uh, what were the fathers like? Well, verse, uh, verse 4 says, The prophets preached to them, and they says, Thus saith the Lord, Turn your, from your evil ways. They did not listen to the prophets. And so we go to these prophets that were there in the minor prophets and, and the major prophets that said, If you know what, guys, don't straighten up. You're headed for Babylon. What they do? Absolutely ignored it. And so he says, Okay, where are your fathers? You know, where are your fathers? If you're going to go down, go down that same, ray, same road, I, have got, I am ready to ask you the question, where are your fathers? Look at verse 6, he says, My servants the prophets, I commanded them, and did not what they say overtake your fathers? So they returned and said, Just as the Lord determined to do to us, according to all the ways. In hindsight, they were able to say, yep, the prophets were right. And the whole implication of it is, if they did not escape, neither will you escape. We're in the eighth month. Let's jump three months later. In verse 7, we come to, to the 24th day of the seventh month. And, and I think it'd be good just to try to, uh, I don't know how you do this. When I think of the sixth month, I think of June, and I think of the eighth month, I think of uh, I think of August, and now I'm over here to the uh, 11th month, and I think November. That's absolutely wrong. It helps me to grab it, though. Their Jewish year started in the spring, right around Easter. Passover uh, is about where it started. That was the beginning of the Jewish year, the first month. And so, you know, uh, Passover comes, what, from the end of March until middle of, middle of April, maybe the latter part of April. And so that's when their Jewish year began. And so all of a sudden now we have these prophets that are there and then there is the vision of horsemen. Hello, how does the book of Revelation begin? Chapter 4 in the book of Revelation, you believe in God. Chapter 5, believe also in me. And you get to chapter 6 and guess what you have? You have four horsemen. And Isaiah, or pardon me, Zechariah sees exactly the same thing. And so uh, it, the first horse he saw, verse 8, he sees it at night. He sees a man on a red horse that's standing by the myrtle trees in the hollow. And behind him there were th horses of three, uh, three other colors. And then I said, verse 9, uh, who are these? What's the meaning of these horses in this vision? And, and you got to get this. It's not literal horses. It is a vision, and the horses represent something else. He said, I'll tell you what these horses represent. I will show you what they are in verse 9. 
These are the ones whom the Lord has sent to go throughout the earth. And so here are these heavenly messengers in a vision symbolized by these, these horses of, of, a, of three different colors. These are the ones the Lord has sent to walk to and fro on the earth. So they, uh, they answer the angel of the Lord who stood among the myrtle trees and says, guess what? We've done just what God told us to do. We walked all over the earth and guess what has happened? The whole earth is at peace. You know what's just happened? Babylon has been destroyed two years ago. And now all of a sudden you've got a brand new kingdom covering the world. And it is a time of world peace. And the messenger is, how do you know that? Because God sent his angels out, the horses out, and they went all over the earth. And all the earth, verse 11, is resting quietly. Uh, then the angel of the Lord and said, O Lord of hosts, how long will you, will you not have mercy on Jerusalem and on the cities of Judah against whom you were angry? The last 70 years we've been in captivity. Lord, how long will it be before you show mercy? And verse 13, the Lord answered the angel who's talked to me with good and comforting words. I'm through with my anger. You need to understand this is the nature of God. He's angry against those who are evil, but whenever they are not like their fathers, whenever they repent and listen to the commandments of God, the Lord says, I am zealous for Jerusalem and for Zion with great zeal. Uh, the word zeal has to do with fervency. It's, 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 it's a word sometimes used to, descri to describe water as it boils. Now you think about water boiling, and God said, I am fervently on Jerusalem's side. There's peace in the world. Guess why? Because my people have come back from captivity. And, uh, uh, and, and, but he said, I am exceedingly, verse 15, angry with the nations that are at ease. The world's at peace. And the Lord said, I'm not through with them. But they were the ones who helped me. I was a little angry and they helped me but they did it with evil intent. When Nebuchadnezzar came against Jerusalem, he was an evil man. And the Lord said, but he was helping me accomplish my purpose. And you need to remember, I am not through with these nations. Right now, my focus is on, the, is on the God's people who've come back from captivity. And guess what we're going to do? Verse 16, my house shall be built. Isn't that what we read last week about Haggai? You know, you're dwelling in your own houses. My house has not yet be, been built. And a surveyor's line shall be stretched out all over Jerusalem. Dirk, you know what that's all about. You get ready to build a house, you take that surveyor's line and you measure, measure it all. And before you put up the four corners, if it's a, a square house, rectangular house, you do cross measurement and everything. And he says, my surveyor's line is not just at my house. It is over all of Jerusalem. I'm zealous for Jerusalem. I'm boiling with fervent uh, desire to help those who have, have come back from captivity. And that surveyor line is all over the city. And look at verse 17. My city shall again spread out through prosperity. What a message to that small remnant of Jews who came back from Babylon to captivity. You got to understand you know, if 50,000 is the number that came back, and that's the approximate number that came back, what was the population before? It could have been a million people. And so from a million people that went into captivity, just 50,000 of them come back, and the city is in ruins, and they draw straws to see who gets to live in Jerusalem. Guess who gets to live in Jerusalem? Those who lost. You don't want to live in Jerusalem. That place, is, that place is in shambles. But remember, my city shall be built, and the Lord will again comfort Zion and will again choose Jerusalem. You see the word again three times? They had been God's chosen people. They had been God's chosen city. And the Lord said, I am ready to do it again. He says that to that small remnant. Verse 18, I looked, another vision, and this time he sees four horns. As you've studied the prophets, even the major prophets, but horns always represent kings. 
whenever there was the description of the Alexander the Great prophesied in Daniel chapter 8, he, he's, he, there is one horn that is on that goat. You remember the goat that came, that came from the west hopping across the earth? And that horn was broken, and in its place four horns came up. And he says, that, that horn is the first king. And when, when Alexander dies, there will be four kings, four horns that come up out of the place. And so he says, I looked, and I saw a vision, and there were four horns. And, and who, what do these horns represent? Well, don't take off on your imagination and say, well, I'm, they, rec, they, they represent Texas uh, Texans, you know, the Longhorns of Texas, or the, you know, you understand? And that's what people do. They just jump all over the place. Why not God tell you what these four horns? Here are four horns. I have no how they were attached or detached. It doesn't matter. If it had mattered, God would have thought. Would have, but there are four horns that appeared. You know what these are? These are the four horns that have scattered Jerusalem. They've, they have scattered not just Jerusalem, but Judah and Israel. And so you go back to the fall of that northern kingdom, you know, uh, uh, you know uh, what uh, fell in uh, what, uh, um, 722 B.C., and now, and, and now we're way, way far over. We're in about 535, 533 30, B.C., and they've been scattered. And, and then the southern kingdom falls. It falls in the time of Nebuchadnezzar, 535, 536 B.C. And now, or, or pardon me, 606 B, 605 B.C. or 606 B.C. And they've scattered them. And the Lord says, I saw four horns. And right behind them were four carpenters. I love the King James. I, I know carpenters. And, and, and I know it's got craftsmen here. And I guess that's skilled carpenters and everything. You know, that's the finished carpenters, and he sees these horns, and then right behind them are these four, four carpenters, and, and I said, what's that all about? Explain to me. And here's the way you've got to learn to study the book of Revelation. Let God give you the explanation. Don't take off and run all over the place. And the book of Zechariah, he does. I'll tell you what these carpenters are. As there are four horns that have torn down all, of the, all the people and scattered my people, these are the craftsmen that come to terrify, I like that word terrify, the work of those who have scattered them to cast out the horns of the nation that lift up their horn against me and Jerusalem to scatter it. I hate chapters of vision because you, you, there's another vision that just pops up right after that. Four horns, four car carpenters, and then there's a man standing there. He's got a tape measure. He's got a tape measure and he's measure, he got a measuring line in his hand, chapter 2, verse 1. Where are you going? Uh, I asked. He said, I'm going to measure Jerusalem to see what its width and its length is. And uh, there's an angel who talked with me going out and another angel coming out to meet him. And he said, run to this man, young man and said, forget the tape measure. God is jealous toward this remnant, toward these Jews that have come back from captivity. And Jerusalem shall be built and it will be you couldn't measure how big it's going to be. It's going to be scattered. I will measure Jerusalem. Verse 4, Jerusalem shall be inhabited as towns without walls because of the multitude of the animals and the livestock. And we know exactly how much livestock they brought back with them. That's listed over in the book of Ezra. The, exactly how much they brought. And the Lord said, don't worry. You don't, I'm going to multiply you whenever you get in the land. But what about that wall? You know, we talk about Zerubbabel being there and Nehemiah coming later finally to build the wall. Sometimes we have Nehemiah coming almost 70 years later. I, I question whether that is true, but during that time when they didn't have walls, I will be, verse 5, I will be a wall of fire. Okay, come against my beloved. Come against those whom I, whom I love. Come against those who the fervency of my love for them and my concern for them is like the fervency of boiling water, and you will not be able to lay a hand on these who have come back. Read the book of Nehemiah where, where the enemies, the Samaritans in that land, did everything they could to stop the rebuilding of the city. They lied, they sent, they, they sent lies back to the king of Persia and did everything they could to stop the building of, of, that, of, of the walls in, in, in the days of Nehemiah, and they could not do it. And then, I, then the Lord says, up, up, verse 6, 
flee from the land of the north. Where's the land of the north? That's where Assyria had come in. That's where Babylon has come in. And if you're still one of those who've been scattered and you are up in Assyria and you are over in Babylon, you'd better get out of there. The Lord said, I am exceedingly angry against those nations. The place of safety is not to be found in Assyria and in Babylon, though it might look like it's the place of Syria. Up, flee from the mountains of the north, says the Lord. I will spread you abroad like the four winds of heaven. You are about to be scattered again. And when those nations fell, guess what? Those nations that had been scattered in turn find themselves scattered again. Verse 7, up, Zion, escape. You who dwell with the daughters of Babylon. Any Jews left over in that area of Babylon where Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego have been, you had better get out of Babylon. For thus says the Lord, He sent me after glory to the nations, or the Lord of hosts, He sent me after glory to the nations which plundered you, for he who touches you touches the apple of my eye. Who's He talking about? He's talking about the Assyrians, and he's talking about that about the folks of, of, of Babylon. Apple of the eye is not a; it's a Hebrew idiom, and uh, it, uh, a a modern equivalent like you know you looked at your beloved you know when you were in the dating, and her eyes just twinkled. That's the picture here. You have attacked the twinkle in the eyes of the one that I love so much. And I will shake my hand against them. You have attacked Jerusalem. They've been in captivity for 70 years. Your days are numbers. And so he says to the daughters of, of, of Zion, those who are not over in Babylon, he says, Sing and rejoice. I am coming and I will dwell in your midst. And guess what? Many nations shall seek after you. You've got to understand the Messianic prophets. In the book of Isaiah, the Lord will establish his, uh, his uh, the mountain of the, of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains, and all nations shall flow into it. They'll say, you know, let us go up to, the, uh, uh, to Jerusalem, for the law of the Lord will go out of Jerusalem and his commandments from Zion. And so the nations in the time of Christianity, those who had plundered, then were brought back to God and sought God, not from Judaism in Jerusalem, but from the, from the Lord's church that started in that very city. And the Lord says in verse 12, guess what? I will take possession of Judah as an inheritance. Think of the book of Ephesians. The church of Jesus Christ is called the heritage of God. You are going to have so much favor in my eyes. You will be my heritage and then he says, rest of the world, shut up. Be silent, all flesh, before the Lord. He is aroused from his holy habitation. He's aroused from heaven, and he's coming to, to, to inhabit the temple of God, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. You are a temple of God through the Spirit of God. Messianic and beautiful. You're one of the 50,000. Where's your faith? You don't see it happening. You can barely survive. Every time you try to turn around, there is that adversity. And what a message there is, there is given by God. Chapter 3, changing pick, changing situation. This time, he sees another vision. It's not called a vision, but he sees Joshua the high priest. Now remember, not Joshua that caused the, uh, the, uh, the sun to stand still. This is Joshua the high priest. And when he looks at Joshua, the high priest, guess who's standing right beside him? The devil, Satan, is standing at his right hand to oppose him. If Satan can stop the worship of God when, those, when that remnant gets back to that city, they will not be God's people. They cannot, they cannot approach God. And so he sees a vision, and standing right beside Joshua, the high priest, is Satan, and Joshua's clothes are filthy, dirty. And the Lord says to him, he says, to the, the Lord rebuke you, Satan. That's in verse 2. The Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebukes you. You are simply like a piece of wood that's been kept in the fire, and you move it out from the fire. Guess what's going to happen to it? It's going to burn down and go out. 
You are there thinking you're going to destroy. You are like a brand that's taken out of the fire. Your light of, of that, that uh, looks so fiery, it is about to die. Verse 3, he's clothed in filthy garments. Verse 4, he says, Then he answered and spoke to those who stood before him, Take away his filthy garments from him. See, I have removed your iniquity from you. What's the filthy garments represent? Joshua's sin. Now then, the Lord has taken away their filthy garments and put on him the priestly robes. But the reclothing of Joshua represents God forgiving Joshua. You've got to have a holy high priest. And now here's Joshua. And, and, and who's Joshua? He's God's chosen high priest. He's the highest uh, religious official in that, among that remnant that is there. And, and, uh, and he put clothes on him. And the, an, and the angel uh, of the Lord stood by. That, that's in verse, uh, verse 5. Two, got two pieces of paper sticking together. And in verse 6, then the angel of the Lord admonished Joshua and says, Thus saith the Lord, if you will do this, then this is what will happen. Here's Joshua, angel of the Lord in this vision says to Joshua, and when Joshua saw the vision, read the vision, here, here is a message directly to Joshua. If you will walk in my ways, keep my commandments, you shall also rule over my house. You shall judge my house, and, I, and you'll have charge of all of the temple courts, and I will give you a place to walk among those who stand here. Hear, O Joshua, the high priest, you and your companions who sent before you are a wondrous sign. I am bringing forth my servant, the branch. We'll get to that a little bit later. But you see how in the New King James it's all capitalized? How he says, my servant, the word my capitalized, the word branch capitalized, and understand capitalization is put in there by the translators but they are exactly right and then all of a sudden he says and this is my branch and, jo and, and he says Joshua you be faithful do do your work and someday through your and your companions I will bring about the coming of my of my servant the branch behold the, the stone is laid before Joshua Upon those stones are seven eyes. I will engrave with this inscription, says the Lord, and I will remove your iniquity from the land uh, of that land in one day. First day you serve, Joshua. First time that sacrifice is, is offered, it's over. Not only do you not have filthy garments, but all of that remnant no longer have the filthy garment. And in that day, there will be a time of peace, and every man will invite his neighbor under his vine and under his fig tree. Chapter 4, now the angel of the Lord talked with me, came back and wakened me as a man was out of his sleep. Another vision, vision of Joshua. Now he sees something that is really, really weird. You got to let God explain it. But what he sees is a lampstick of solid gold. You know what that candlestick was, do you not? You know what they would, would imagine they had seen, and that is that candlestick that was in the most holy place. And, and there was a bowl on top of it, and uh, there were seven lamps, and even pipes came, and, uh, and, and pipes came to all of the seven lamps. It, had, it, it, it is the menorah with seven receptacles out on the, out on the edges. I, I don't think the menorah has seven, but you understand, that's what that lamp stack, that, and it, had, it had that. Now, on either side of that are two olive trees. What do you get out of olives? Oil, don't say permit if you like, you know, that's not, that's not what you suck out. That, that, it's the olive oil. What do you use olive oil for? You've got to have this candlestick, and it's got to have the oil, and this oil is going to supply, be supplied by God by two olive trees so that the temple of God can be restored and the candlestick of God will burn once again. So, uh, 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 verse, verse 4, or pardon me, chapter 4, there are those two olive trees. Verse 4, I answered and said to the angel, what are these trees? And he said, you don't know what they are? No, I don't either, Lord, tell me. And he said, no, my Lord, 
So he answered to me, say, this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel. Wait a minute. Did we not just have the word of the Lord that came to Joshua the high priest? Now here is the word of the Lord that comes to Zerubbabel. The message to Joshua was, you live right and you do right. The message to Zerubbabel, who was the governor, the builder that came back to head up the building of that temple, the Lord says, it is not by, by, by power nor, nor by might. Zerubbabel, you're not on your own. You don't need your own power. You don't need your own might. My spirit, says the Lord, is going to be there. In fact, Zerubbabel, you think there's a mountain before you. But Zerubbabel, when you see that great mountain, it will become level. Remember what Jesus said? You have the faith as the faith of a mustard seed. You'll say to the mountain, be cast into the sea. And that's exactly the message given, given to Zechariah. There's a mountain before you. You've got an insurmountable job with only 50,000 people there to rebuild that uh, a temple that, needs to, that hopefully would be like the temple that they'd had in Solomon's day, 143,000 men for seven years building it. You, you, it's like a mountain before you. It shall be brought, it shall become plain, and he shall bring forth the capstone, the top stone uh, in the building of the temple with shouts of grace, grace to it. Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me and says, Zerubbabel, you have laid the foundation of this temple. They've already, you remember, book of Haggai, the sixth month, ninth month, and, and he says from the ninth month old, let's see what's happened. Now he said, Zerubbabel, you've already started building the, the tabernacle. You have laid, you have laid uh, the, the foundation and uh, uh, and his hand shall also finish it. Zerubbabel, you've brought them back. You've got the remnant. You've got 50,000 people. And you have started building this, and you're going, to put, you're going to be able to finish it. What a message to that remnant. For who has despised the day of small things? And it's imagine what he talks about, a plumb line. <laughs> Dirk, you know what that's like? You get ready to... You hang up a string, and, and Chuck, you, uh, uh, Chuck Reeves, you've been involved in it. You used to work for Duck and every, Dirk over there. Plum, plum line just hangs the string. It's a measuring device. How insignificant is that? Oh, I, it's, I could do it without it. No, you couldn't. And you need to recognize that the plumb line that is there, uh, these, it, it, the plumb line, and these are the eyes of the Lord which scan to and fro over the earth. I'm not sure the exact antecedent of, of, of these, pardon me, these seven things rejoice, and it's probably the seven eyes that are, that are, that are described in the, in, the, in the previous paragraph we looked at. Then I answered and said, who on earth are these fig, who are these olive trees? Who are these two olive trees? One on either side of the lampstick. And I further answered and said to me, what are these two olive branches that drip into the receptacles of the gold pipes that go down to those seven bowls? And he answered and said, Don't you know what these two olive trees are? I have just told you. Joshua and Zerubbabel, they are my two anointed ones. And so, so, so we, leave, we leave this vision. The Lord's already said, candlestick's going to be there, and you're going to be able to go back and enjoy being there. And then all of a sudden, he looks again, and there's another vision. Is this like Revelation? No sooner do you finish one vision of Revelation, and there's another one, and another one, and another one, and another one. And if you stop and try to make something of everything in there, you'll get lost. But if you'll just read the text, what does he see? He sees the scroll. You know what that is? The thing of a book. And, and it has, has words that are written on it. And he said, what do you see? He says, I see a scroll. How big is it? It's not a little teeny tiny one that you turn with your hands. It is 30 feet by 15 feet. Uh, and he said to me, this is the curse that goes out over the whole face of the earth. Written on that scroll are the words of the curse of God that's coming over the whole earth. And he says, every thief, every evil person that is destroyed and stolen from my people when you came in and destroyed the city, every thief, thief, thief will be expelled and every perjurer shall be expelled. And I will send out the curse 
It shall enter the very house of the thief. It will enter the house of the, the individual who swears falsely by, by name. And it shall stay there. The angel of the Lord came to me and said to me, lift up your eyes. Something else for you to see. He saw, sees the scroll. And God, you got, if you're going to read this, don't try to read, read it all the way through. Read each paragraph and then just say, what, the, what just happened here? It's not, that, it's not that hard if you'll put it in this historical setting and let it have the very, very meaning. This time he sees a basket. It is a basket that is going forth, and, there it, and, and he says this is their resemblance throughout the whole earth, and the basket has a lead disc on top of it. Not baskets have a, a, a basket woven type lid. Not this one. He sees a basket. And it's got, it's got the, a solid piece of metal made of lead, and it's sitting right on top of that basket. And guess what's in the basket? There's a woman in that basket. What? Yeah, you want to let God explain? Oh, yeah, there'd be a whole lot easier to try to make it up, right? And so here is this woman that is inside the basket, and guess what her name is? Her name is Wickedness. And, and, and he thrust, and uh, this is wickedness, and he thrust her down in the basket and threw the lead, co lead, lead, cover, lead cover over the top of it. God reaches down. Here's wickedness inside that. Here is this woman, and he slaps the lid down, pushes her down, and, puts, and, 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 puts, and slaps the lid down tight. Uh, verse, 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 verse 9, I raised up my eyes, and there were two women coming in the wind, in their wings that is an amazing thing i have nothing other than to say don't focus so much on these women with wings don't lose sight of what they're doing you know what they do they pick up this basket and with the wings like a stork they lift up the basket between earth and heaven and guess where what do they do the angel talked with me he said where are they carrying this basket and he said i'll tell you where they're carrying it they're carrying it to babylon to the plains of Shinar. I am taking this basket of evil and, and, and dropping it over in Babylon. Guess where Babylon is? Doesn't exist. Darius has come, Darius has come, and, uh, and uh, destroyed Babylon, and lo and behold, this woman is taken to Babylon, and she is wickedness personified. On my notes in the right-hand column, I've got the statement, uh, uh, it, the passage does not say when Babylon will be released, though it does say it will sit there on its base. But someday, from Babylon, there will come a woman of wickedness. Revelation chapter 17. That woman that is there is even called Babylon. What's she like? She's the most sinful woman there is. And so the Lord said, I've taken this evilness that is, that is all of Babylon, and Babylon is no more, and it's going to sit over there until, until the fulfillment of the book of Revelation. We could chase that rabbit. Don't have time to do it. I wish we could go to Revelation 17 and 18. Next vision, he looks and he sees four chariots coming from between two mountains, and the mountains were mountains of bronze. The first chariot has red horses, second one black, third white, the fourth uh, dappled horses, and they are strong steeds. I have circled on the screen strong steeds because in, in about four verses, we're going, to, we're, going, we're going to learn about these horses and what these horses are doing. The angel said, These are the four spirits of heaven to go, go forth from their station before the Lord of all the earth. The black horse is going to the north, and the white horse is going, is going to the north, and the dappled horses is going to the south country. Verse 7, Then these four steeds went out, eager to go. They might walk to and fro among the earth. And they said, Go and walk to and fro the earth. So they walked to and fro. And he called to me and said, See, those who go to the north country have given rest to my spirit in the north country. It's a time of peace. They've come back from Babylonian captivity and all that trouble that's come out of the north, God's four horsemen are keeping it from coming. 
Implication evidently is the one that went south did the same thing, though it is not stated in the text. Then the Lord, word of the Lord came to me, receive the gift from the captives, and they are given by name. These are what those that are among the remnant that has come back. And in the same day I entered in the house of Josiah, the son of Zephaniah, and I take, took the silver and gold and made an elab, elaborate crown, and I set it on the head of Joshua. Here's a priest. He's already got the priestly turban on his head. We, that was highlighted, I think, uh, in, in previous uh, verses. They were there when they took away his filthy clothes, and they put the priestly uh, turban on his head. That's what the priest wore. Now, all of a sudden, right beside, right beside that turban, maybe even overlaying, laying on top of it, is a crown of gold. What on earth is this all about? And he says, I'll tell you what it's about. When you put that on his hand, verse 12, you say, Behold the man whose name is the branch. Have we not already known who the branch is? He's my servant that someday is going to come. He is my servant. He is the branch. And someday my servant, the branch, will come. May I emphasize to you that whenever Jesus came out of Egypt, he went and lived in Nazareth because the prophet said he shall be called, guess what? A branch. That's the meaning of that word Nazarene. And so in, Isaiah, in, in, uh, in Zechariah's day, here's a picture of the branch that is going to come. And he's got a, he's got a crown on his head and all that is involved in that. It has, has a crown on his head. And now we know who the branch is. He's the Nazarene. The Hebrew word, it's spoken of by the prophets in the plural, said that he shall be called the branch. He's called that several times. And what's, what, what's the branch the Nazarene going to do? He shall build the temple of the Lord. He shall bear the glory. He shall sit and rule on the throne. He'll be a priest on a throne. Wait a minute. From what tribe do the priests come? Levi, what tribe does the king come? Judah, Jesus cannot be a king on a throne and be a priest. You know how the Lord set, set, settles that? Over in the right-hand side it says, the last statement on the right hand, Jesus to be a priest and a king on the throne of Melchizedek. He's not a priest after the order of the Levites. He is a priest after the order of Melchizedek. Guess what Melchizedek was? He was a priest and a king. You want the death blow to premillennialism that says Jesus is going to come back and then become a king in Jerusalem? Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 4 says, If he comes on this earth, he cannot be a king. He cannot be a priest because the priest can only come out of the tribe of Levi. But premillennialism, thousand-year reign, the Lord's going to come back and set up Judaism with all the Levitical priests and all the Levitical, Levit, 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 Levitical feast days. Jesus can't be a priest. He cannot be a high priest in that kind of kingdom. But in the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ, in the church of Christ, in that kingdom, he can be both a priest and a king. And here is a vision that Zechariah sees physically. He sees on Joshua a crown and a turban. And the message from heaven is, that is the branch. That's the Nazarene that is going to come. Uh, that's it. That is a stopping place, and we made six chapters. I was hoping that we'd get through chapter 7. I feel a little bit more comfortable. I didn't think we'd get through more than four chapters, and so uh, I hope that you can go home. and It's not hard to read this. Go home and read it.
and just see the vision, think about what it means in that time, and you'll be able to understand it. And it'll help you understand how to interpret the book of Revelation. All right, that's it for tonight. Thank you very much.